Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to get started. Um, before we get started with the second session for today, I just want to give a shout out again to all of the people and all of the organizations, both on campus as well as off campus, that made this event and are making this event, I'll put in the present tense, such a, a great one. Um, if you're just joining us, um, welcome. You missed a fantastic first session uh, where we had uh, Anna Mallo and Dustin Gibson kind of leading us off with some of the issues that we are uh, really trying to explore today. And of course, we'll be doing that in the session that follows my introduction and the uh, roundtable discussion later on. And then if you can stay with us for the whole day, uh, the day will end with a fantastic uh, presentation and performance by Leroy Moore, uh, who uh, is joining us here from uh, the Bay Area. Um, as uh, m many of you know, uh, my name is David Serlin, and I'm a professor of communication here uh, at uh, UC San Diego, and along with uh, my colleague and friend Brian Goldfarb, we are the faculty uh, members who kind of are part of the transdisciplinary disability studies group, but we could not do what we are doing today, which is providing all of us with fantastic and painful and important things to talk about, as well as food and drink and coffee and conversation, uh, a room on the fourth floor where you can chill out. All these things uh, are made possible both by this institution, but by the uh, voluntary work of so many graduate students from many different disciplines at this university. And I guess, can we just give them uh, a round of applause? <laughs> because really, you, we are all here because of, of them and the critical work that they do. Um, so I'm going to ease from that uh, into an introduction of uh, this next session. But before I do that, um, there was a professor in our department, the communication department, who was one of the founding members of our department named Herb Schiller. And Herb Schiller was very famous for coming to a big lecture, and he would have a copy of the New York Times. And he was so agile as a lecturer that he was able to come, come in and like say, okay, let's look at what's going on in the world, and just do a 45-minute uh, lecture based on reading the headlines of the New York Times that day. Um, I'm not going to attempt to do that, but I was struck this morning when I picked up my copy of the New York Times and I found two stories almost on opposite sides. One is, and some of you already know about this, the new museum that has just opened in Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to either read about it or look at some of the images, is absolutely s spectacular and painful to contemplate. It is a memorial to, and here is uh, the front cover. I'm sorry for those of you who can't see it, but I'll describe it. It is a bunch of concrete pylons that are hanging from the ceiling of a vast open space on which have been inscribed the names of counties where uh, people were lynched in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I won't do justice to this image, but it basically is like walking underneath uh, pylons, tons of weight of um, concrete that look like they could fall down on you, which is of course part of their design. And also because it's in the exterior space and it's open to the sky, when it rains, it rains down rust, i.e. it rains down an equivalent of blood. Um, to say that no museum has been like this in the United States would be an understatement. We're not exactly a nation that deals well with history, and we're certainly not a nation that deals well with painful uh, past events or phenomena that we'd much rather bury uh, under the carpet. And across from that, charming as it might uh, seem in uh, some way, is the announcement by our Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, that, and I'll just read the headline, for the poor and the old disabled, government proposes a rent increase across from each other, which is just one of those circumstances of, you could say, coincidence, but probably less coincidental and more an effect of where we are in this historical moment. 
that these two things could coexist in the same nation, and also that these two things, in their own ways, are ways of thinking about not only race and history and disability and the role of the state in either defining those histories or attempting to erase them in some way as well. So the two speakers that are going to follow my introduction, I think in their own ways, are addressing some of these ways of thinking about history, thinking about um, the ways that institutional violence has a history, and it's a history that's not over. It's a history that's still very present, and even how those iterations may change and how an African-American head of uh, housing and urban development could be spearheading that is a whole other way of talking about the presence of those complex and contradictory histories. So both of our speakers will, I think, bring the state and national histories back into the frame in ways that Anna and Dustin introduced in, um, their, uh, the, in the first session. So let me do uh, the job of introducing our speakers for this session. Uh, Nir Nirmala uh, Ervelis is a professor of social and cultural studies in education at the University of Alabama. Her teaching and research interests lie in the areas of disability studies, critical race theory, transnational feminism, sociology of education, and post-colonial studies. Um, Nirmala has written a ton of material, but some of the things I will point to are a book called Disability and Difference in Global Contexts, which was published in 2012 and was awarded a Critics' Choice Award from the American Educational Studies Association. And she's currently working on a book-length manuscript, which is currently called Cripping Empire. So clearly she's got the state on her mind. Uh, and I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention that Nirmala uh, was awarded a Senior Scholar Award from the Society for Disability Studies this year, um, which, uh, for those of you who don't know the organization or the award, is really given to people who are outstanding in their field and have made contributions to disability studies, um, uh, both in the United States and in, in a more global uh, con context as well. So uh, Nirmala will be uh, giving a talk called Scenes of Subjection, Disability at the Intersections of Race, Gender, and Class in the Carceral State. Nirmala. Thank you. Can you all, can, is everyone, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to come here. And most, most, most importantly, thank you for allowing me to be part of this incredible group of speakers whose work I know, like I'm, I'm a boring professor, and a lot of the people who are on this pa panel today are people who are actually working in the field, making the, doing some of the hard labor that some of us professors pretend to represent. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to appreciate you all for that invitation too. Um, I'm also, I'm actually glad, I thank you for David for um, mentioning the, opening of the new museum in Alabama. As a person who, when I go and give talks in Alab when I go to give talks in, uh, in several places, the fact that I am from the University of Alabama and that I have, I, I have a child who was born there, so she is Alabamian, uh, it always haunts me about the fact that we also locate that history, we kind of like focus that history as if the South has to bear the blame or hold the space of the kind of violence that exists all over. And today's presentations talk about the fact that the carceral state, even as it exists, and I'm actually kind of proud that Alabama is the place that has produced the museum, because it's also saying that, I mean, there is, of course, we still have our issues, but the point is that it's saying that we are producing a history. We are, we are, we are willing to recognize a history that as a nation, we all support. because. I mean, it, every time I say I'm from Alabama, I have, besides football, yeah, I mean, I, am, I, I work at the university that is the big football school, the only other way we are known is, is in the space as if w the violence lies there. And my presentation today will be located in the South, 
I mean, one part of it, which I'm going to be also, I'm also going to say I'm reading it. I had access copies. I don't know where they are. There, there are I'm sorry, there are access copies, and I think we have some, uh, if there are people who, we have large print version and regular print version. Uh, are, if you raise your hand, we can distribute those. Okay. Because I know that sometimes people find it hard to follow, and I, being the boring academic, will read, because that way I'll be focused. And uh, the other thing I was going to say, which was also, because I'm so glad Leroy Moore is here today. Usually when I'm doing this presentation, there's a big section of my paper where I cite Leroy, but he's here today, so I don't have to cite him because you will be hearing his work in a, in a large group, because I also wanted to pay attention to so much of this work, even though it's represented in particular kinds of bodies, is always collective, and some of that work has real material violence in people's lives. So this construction is work that is connected to what people do, and I'm trying to make sense of it, okay? Sorry, okay. Kimberly, uh, large, uh, we have one or two more. We have one large print, and uh, anyone else? We have just one small print. I can have small print. Small print? I, oh. small print's fine. All right, so. Either way, fine. Thank you, oh, And um, because I'm reading, I'm going to be a lot slower when I talk. I'm more animated, so. But let me know if at any time, I have a, oh, the other, other thing is I have a PowerPoint to kind of also help orient people, though there are two photographs that I found I had to use. But mostly my PowerPoint is to distract you from staring at me <laughs> and just doing the, yeah, I'm self-conscious as a presenter, yes. Okay, so the title of my paper, and I, I'm sorry, I just left out the race, class, and gender because I was tired to type there, but it's already talking about the intersections of disability. This is a quote from Sarah Martin, Georgia Stockade Blues, which is written by, Sarah Martin was a woman in prison writing about, uh, about blues in prison. Yeah. Both legs shackled to a ball and chain, pleading for mercy, but it's all in vain. Ankles all swollen, can't wear no shoes. I've got the meanest kind of Georgia Stockade Blues, unquote. In this presentation, I foreground how the labor of disability is appropriated by the carceral state to implicate bodies and justify violence against them at the intersections of social difference. Beginning with historical narratives of women facing unimaginable violence within post-slavery systems of punishment that included first the convict leasing system and later the chain gang, I mark the historical continuities and discontinuities with contemporary violent practices of the carceral state against women and girls that now include segregated special education classrooms, alternative schools, juvenile detention homes, and other institutional settings. In particular, I trace how the socio-political category of disability is utilized to produce the carceral subject and discuss the conceptual as well as material implications, most of which actually Dustin Gibson kind of described earlier uh, in the previous presentation, when disability is included in this analysis. Engendering deviance through disability in carceral spaces, this is subheading. Sarah Haley's historical narrative, No Mercy Here, Gender Punishment and the Making of Jim Crow Modernity offers a vivid yet disturbing account of how post-slavery, and I quote, the criminal legal system crafted, reinforced, and required black female deviants as part of the broader constitution of Jim Crow modernity premised upon the devaluation and dehumanization of black life, unquote. The task that Haley sets out to accomplish is difficult because she has no first-person accounts of the heinous practices that occurred when black female prisoners were contracted out to private individuals and companies under the convict leasing system to build under the most terrible conditions the railroads, the turpentine farms, the plantations, the brickyards, sawmills, coal mines, and broom-making camps, as well as to clean, to pave, 
and to maintain city streets. When convict leasing was eliminated in 1903, it was replaced by the chain gang that significantly contributed to the infrastructure development in the state of Georgia. Haley's historical sources lie in the range of contradictory artifacts, clemency cases, whipping ledgers, medical and political dockets, and annual prison reports. The contradiction lies in that the very artifacts that sought to humanize imprisoned black women ironically reproduced their social death, and I quote, through the erasure of their interior desires, their beliefs, their sentiments and thought pathways, relegating them to objects of torture and annotations on a ledger, unquote. So even while heeding Sadia Hartman's lament that, and I quote, to read the archive is to enter a mortuary, unquote, Haley nevertheless reads along the archival grain of death and destruction as well as against it to uncover black women's punishment themed blues, the quote I read earlier, what she called a sabotage practice that contested modernity's carceral institutions viewed by these women as obstacles to their independence, sexual and economic freedom. Haley's text, oh, that I don't know what happened there, but I will tell you what it is, and I can always share that handout to you later. Haley's text, and I, sorry, is more than a history of labor and a history of carceral, of the carceral state. Rather, the conceptual power of Haley's text lies in its relational analysis. And that's basically some of the statistics that I took a photograph from on her page where it talks about the ways in which the percentages of black women in those prisons at that time to the percentages of white women, and it's like the numbers are like 340 and 1. So you can see the ratios, and the same thing when they do it with black women, black men. I mean, the kinds of ratios we are still familiar with today. So those were just some statistics that were there, but that's why I put it there. And I'm, the conceptual power of Haley's text lies in this relational analysis, one that foregrounds that what is offered as, and I quote, a resource for the consolidation of an opposing, stable, coherent, legible, juridical subject, white woman, so in other words, it's the construction of a white woman, is offered and in the sexual anti-normativity, in fact, the queerness of the black female bodies, arrested and arresting deviance, reinforced through the carceral political domain. And this is a quote from Haley. By deploying this analysis, Haley argues that gender is constructed by and through race, where carceral institutions shaped constructions of gender by sedimenting invented taxonomies of female subjects with race as the vestibule of absolute difference a fixed dividing line that constructs gender. Here then, convict labor produces not just the surplus for the creation of the modern state, in this case, Georgia, but also for the production of black women as juridical inverts, perverse, primitive, pathological, and therefore unentitled to both protection and freedom. Haley thus draws on Dylan Rodriguez's conceptualization of the prison as a regime and carcerality as a practice, where assault and destruction of the black female body in specific contexts, in this, in, in this case, riots, scaffolds, and penal camps, were fundamental to the construction of white civil society, white human value, and white personhood and in this particular case, more specifically, white womanhood. In other ways, I'm drawing that connection. I mean, I'm actually not drawing on it. I'm, I'm quoting Dylan, Dylan Rodriguez's work to show that this was basically white supremacy. It's the working of white supremacy. My argument here is to show that while Haley's book describes the historical construction of race, class, and gender in carceral contexts, 
the labor that disability is coerced to perform in these spaces of violence is seldom recognized. In almost every page of Haley's text, disability as pathological deviance is casually invoked, but never critically engaged as mutually constitutive of black femininity via invocations of, and this is a quote from, this is, these are the actual words that Haley uses, deviant motherhood, physical grotesqueness, the capacity for hard labor, the impossibility of sexual, emotional, and physical injury, mental inferiority, and disposability, unquote. Take, for example, the 22-year-old black woman, Eliza Cobb, convicted of infanticide in 1889 with circumstantial evidence, her pregnancy the outcome of rape. Having spent most of her youth cutting and hauling lumber, driving carts and plowing under terrible conditions until she fell very ill, sympathetic advocates petitioned for her clemency on the grounds of flawed evidence. When this petition failed, her advocates provided this piece of evidence, and that's the one I have the photograph, a photograph of Cobb in an ill-fitting striped long dress representing criminality, holding a work implement and staring unsmilingly into the camera. Her successful appeal, finally, her final su 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 successful appeal, which happened 20 years later, depended on her description as, and I quote, a horrible looking person, very ba bur badly burnt about the face, and with a mind, and again quote, not as strong as the average Negroes, unquote. Here, Eliza Cobb became legible to white authorities as an imbecilic, monstrous body that reinforced her position as other through the deployment of ableist constructions of disability. And I just wanted to say that the way I'm talking about ableism, that not that I, I learned to think about ableism with the definition that Dustin Gibson just gave us a little bit earlier, because his definition is really rooted in racism. And so think about it in those contexts. And then I miss my place. OK. Here, the abjection in Cobb's photograph paradoxically depends on disability to justify Cobb's exploited labor in prison camps, while at the same time, disability became the basis of leniency by the state via representations of Cobb as physically and intellectually degenerate. In sharp, in sharp contrast, a white prisoner, Dolly Pritchett, also described in Haley's text, described as, and I quote, a beautiful girl when fixed a little, has a clear blue eye, a cheerful and attractive face, a kind disposition, unquote, was also convicted of infanticide in the early 20th century, a little later after Cobb was convicted. In the photograph, Pritchett wearing a modest long dress holds an implement similar to Cobb's, suggesting that she must have been at work when the photograph was taken. In sharp contrast to Cobb, her advocates successfully argued that Pritchett needed, and I quote, the shelter of a no reform institution. She does need to be placed where her intelligence may be developed and where her pride and spirit of sturdy independence may be conserved." Unquote. Two years later, as compared to the 20, Pritchett was released from prison. It was then that Haley ruefully observes that in contrast to white femininity, which was normativity, black life, the life of the child that was killed, right? The infanticide, actually the child who died, we don't know what happened, becomes legible when it is deployed by white authorities in order to enact violence, that is imprisonment, of black mothers, but is, ineligible, but is illegible when deployed by black subjects to defend against violence, where in this case, motherhoods was a grounds for pardon. Again, in both cases, disability is deployed to enable acts of unspeakable violence in these carceral states, creating what Haley calls unbecoming mothers at the violent intersections 
of race, class, gender, and sexuality. In the very first pages of Scenes of Subjection, Sadia Hartman, and I'm sorry, I should have spelt it earlier, S-A-I-D-I-Y-A, and Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N, refers to the primal scene in Frederick Douglass's autobiography of the beating of his aunt Hester in order to raise questions about the ethics of representing the spectacular character of black suffering. She writes, and I quote, and the quote is up there, what interests me are the ways we are called upon to participate in these scenes. Are we witnesses who confirm the truth of what happened in the face of world-destroying capacities of pain, the distortions of torture, the sheer unrepresentability of terror, and the repression of dominant account? Or are we voyeurs fascinated with and repelled by exhibitions of terror and sufferance? And I also wanted to invoke that because of how, that, how we may be taking up that museum that we just talked about too. So I want to just locate it in context. What does the exposure of the violated body yield? Proof of black sentience or the hidden humanity of the peculiar institution? Or does the pain of the other provide us with the opportunity for self-reflection?" Hartman's questions should give us pause in yet another context where disability is both produced at the site of violence, because she's talking about the violence of, you know, of slavery, and disability was produced there, even as it is used to justify it. Here, in order to get herself out of the representational quandary of witnessing the spectacular character of black suffering, Hartman unwittingly invokes the spectral presence of disability only to require its immediate radical dis disavowal in her ethical attempts to revisit the scene of subjection with re without replicating the grammar of violence. That inevitability results in this routine display of the slaves, or in this case, the incarcerated black women's ravaged body. This appeal to an ethical representation of racial difference hinges on a repudiation of disability as either a voyeuristic fetish and or disability as embodied damage. Here too, disability is put to work to instruct the in incarcerated black, to, sorry, to construct the incarcerated black ungendered body, and yet at the same time, the very liberation of the body okay, requires a repudiation of disability at these multiple scenes of subjection with scarce recognition of the labor that disability does at the intersections of difference. I use the terms unwittingly and implicitly in describing this turning away from disability, not as a critique of Hartman or Haley, whom I'm big fans of and I just love their work, but rather to publicly alert us as to how disability's ghostly presence foregrounds the naturalization of ableist imperatives that have continued to contribute to the incarceration of girls and women of color in these same contexts. This is not to say that disability is unreal, confined to the realm of ghostly discourse. Rather, I argue that ableist constructions of disability as the embodiment of damage are regularly deployed in all carceral spaces that are not limited to prisons, but also include state institutions, special education classrooms, and alternative schools. Feminist disability studies scholar Alison Kafer, in her book Feminist Queer Crip, describes how disability is historically represented as a terrible, unending tragedy, such that any future that includes disability can only be a future to avoid. Resisting this ableist association with, of disability with death, Kafer asks, what does it mean to think of these imagined futures, and hence these live presence differently, where disability is understood otherwise as political as valuable as integral." Unquote. Uncritical deployments of disability by Haley and Hartman occur because as In Jung Kim observes, one commonly conceives of disability as an anomalous incapacity 
inviting harm or providing causes of harm and is located within an individual body isolated from social contexts that facilitate violence. In other words, even critical black feminists may, re may regard disability merely as pathology. Moreover, if at all disability is recognized, it exists to expose the vulnerability of others in order to attain justice for the others themselves. Very rare is the occasion when disability claims our attention to attain justice for itself. Recognizing these discrepancies in critical and transformative circles, Kim raises the following questions. What if would happen if one compares the view of disability as evidence of social injustice and the view of disability as evidence of diversity and belonging? When bodies are wounded by violence, at what point does this consequential body of harm become a being entitled to resources and accommodation beyond the grief associated with the loss of an able body? Hartman's response to Kim's question is existential in her approach while leaping the, leaving a door open to embrace the possibility of disability. She writes, how can a narrative of defeat, oh, maybe not, OK, maybe not. OK, sorry. How can a narrative of defeat enable a place for the living or envision an alternative future? And then she answers, narrative restraint, the refusal to fill in the gaps and provide closure is a requirement of this method, as is the imperative to respect black noise, the shrieks, the moans, the nonsense, the opacity, which are always in excess of the legibility and of the law and which hint at and embody aspirations that are wildly utopian, derelict to capitalism, and antithetical to its attendant discourse. So here, what, this, what Hartman really does brilliantly, and I'm just naming it, what she does is she shifts from refusal to recognition of the transgressive possibilities contained in non-normative spaces that are usually conceived of as damaging. Here, the shrieks, the moans, the nonsense and the pain actually refuse the legitimacy that the normative order enforces in the process of remembering and forgetting, and in doing so has the capacity to append the legible historical ledger as well. Here, the utility of disability to disrupt the hegemonic shows its hand clearly an advancement from previous oppressive iterations of disability. And yet, though Ha Haley and Hartman offer a critique of heteronormative white supremacy by decrying its pathological, patholo pathologizing approach to oppression that significantly defines racialized communities, they implicitly accept that disability is direct evidence of tragic harm, injustice, and deprivation, from which social movements committed to anti-racist, feminist, queer, and or class struggle try to distance themselves. Thus, even while there's an attempt to read disability as transgressive possibility, and it's there, what in inevitably happens in that refusing the spectacle of black suffering inevitably results in refusing disability. I have argued elsewhere in my other work that disability is a historical category whose emergence is closely intertwined with race, another historical category within specific historical conditions of slavery, capitalism, colonialism, and now neocolonialism and, neo and transnational capitalism, in order to appropriate the labor and land for, 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 and for in, in order to appropriate labor and land. Also have to include settler colonialism in that context. Here, both race and disability are intimately connected to each other so that it's hard to decipher where one begins and the other ends. Thus, one mode of analysis is to critically engage the historical materialist conditions that constitute damaged subjectivities by the state within these intimate intersectional spaces in order to disrupt the habitual hegemonic violence of heteronormative white supremacy and its appropriation of labor of black men and black women in the different historical permutations of the carceral state. Moreover, refusing to read disability as damage, I argue that critical emancipatory and analysis and practice 
with work towards naming and transforming the conditions that can enable enslaved, incarcerated women to lay claims to what Avery Gordon calls complex personhood. According to Gordon, complex personhood refers to how people get stuck in the symptoms of their troubles and also transform themselves. That the stories people tell about themselves, about their troubles, about their social worlds, and about their society's problems are entangled and weave between what is immediately available as a story and what their imaginations are reaching toward. It means conferring the respect on others that comes from presuming that life and people's lives are simultaneously straightforward and full of enormously subtle meaning." Unquote. One such contemporary example of this kind of work in my own field is Subini Anama's book, The Pedagogy of Patholo Pathologization, Disabled Girls of Color in the School to Prison Nexus. In this book, Anama animates theories of intersectionality, race, and disability, which she calls discrete, via the lived experience of black and Latina girls who are subjected to a litany of violent practices abetted by the school to prison pipeline, or as I will also argue, the, where school is in fact prison, right? Not very different from the violence described by Haley in the convict labor camps a century earlier. By recognizing these young women via complex personhood, Anama documents their practices of resiliency while at the same time foregrounding the structural interventions needed to resist the pathological criminalization of these young women in our public schools. But this recognition does not require a moving away from disability. Rather, I argue that to bear witness to their complex personhood, notwithstanding these scenes of subjection, it is necessary to draw a materialist intersectional framework, to draw on a materialist intersectional framework that simultaneously foregrounds the materialist as well as representational labor that disability has historically been called to do at the intersections of, at the violent intersections of difference. Thank you. Oh, did I do something?